Problem number three on our rational functions practice quiz here uh, is about this function h. Uh, and they've given us the equation here of h, and then we have to answer a bunch of questions. So it's a rational function. You got a first degree polynomial on top and a second degree polynomial on the bottom. And the first thing it's asking us to do is to find the values that make h undefined. And uh, we know that dividing by zero is what causes rational functions to be undefined. And so we need to figure out the values of x uh, that cause this expression on the bottom to be zero. Let me rewrite my function here. And then I, don't, I'm, I could sit here and plug some numbers in and think about it. But remember, this is something that you should be able to factor pretty easily. And if not, you could find the values of x that cause this bottom to be zero using the quadratic formula. That's another strategy. Um, but I'm just going to factor it. And it's pretty easy to factor. And so I see now that if x is equal to 4 or if x is equal to 2, those are the values that make this function undefined. So that's the answer to my question. So x equal to 4, x equal to 2. Find the values of h, values that make h undefined. And those are the x values that make h undefined. So now it just says write the domain of h. Okay, so there's a lot of ways to write domain. I'm just going to express the domain in words uh, just to be simple. And remember, the domain is all of the possible input values to a function. Okay, and so for us, those are all the possible x values. So the domain of this function is all real x values, all real x, except for these two that cause the function to be undefined. So I'll just say all real x, x is not equal to 4, x is not equal to 2. There's a lot of different ways that you can write the domain, but the most important thing is just making sure that you do not include those values that cause the original equation to be undefined. All right, now for the end behavior, and, and it gets a little tricky here, but, but remember, oh, I'm sorry, I skipped something here. Find the equation of the vertical asymptotes. All right, so that's, that's easy because just like we did in this problem up here and every other rational function that we've graphed, you know that the vertical asymptotes happen when the, for the, at the x values that cause the function to be undefined. So these are literally the vertical asymptotes right here. Those are the x values that cause the function to be undefined. They're also the equations of the vertical asymptotes. Notice equation, and my I write two equations. They both have equal signs. Don't just write 4 and 2. you got to say x equals 4 and x equals 2. All right, now on to the end behavior. So remember, if we want to think about what happens for and let me go start here, as x approaches infinity, I can just think of really, really big values of x and figure out what happens to my function for those really, really big values. Um, now, one of the things we've done a lot of is, is we know that when we put really big values in for x, the 8, the plus 8 doesn't matter anymore down here, and the plus 7 on the top doesn't matter. And so we're, we're kind of left with this thing, x over x squared minus minus 6x. Um, so let me uh, write it this way. h of x is equal to x plus 7 over x squared minus 6x plus 8. And for large x, h of x is about equal to x divided by x squared. And let me just say what I did here. When I get a really big value of x and I square it, it becomes so incredibly bigger than x. If you take a thousand and square it, you get a million, which is a thousand times bigger 
than x in this case. So on the bottom, when you put really big numbers in for x, the, the minus 6x and the plus 8, they don't matter anymore. And what we're re the, really the dominating feature of the bottom for very large x is just x squared, and that's it. That's why I, I just include my x squared over here. On the top, again, if I take a really large value of x and just add 7 to it, I pretty much still have the same really large value of x. So again, my top is just plain old x now. So now I can think of this simpler function and what happens as, as x approaches infinity. Well, it, this sort of simplifies if I cancel to one of the x's out to this. And you can see now that if x is really, really large, this just approaches 0. And you can see that even as x approaches negative infinity, if I put a really, really large negative number into this, it's still getting closer and closer to 0, just from the, from the negative side. So that's my end behavior. And that informs my horizontal asymptote. Remember, this equation is going to have a horizontal asymptote at y equal to 0. And again, that's an equation. It has an equal sign. Horizontal asymptotes are, happen at a particular y value. Um, and that, then finally, we have a couple more little bits and pieces to, to do here. Um, we just need to find the x and the y-intercepts of our, of our equation. Well, the x-intercept is when the function equals 0. So let me just... Uh, write this out like this. This is basically the equation that I want to solve in order to figure out what values of x cause this function to be 0, to have a y value of 0. That's where I find my x-intercepts. And you'll notice that <clears throat> I, I need to be concerned about my extraneous solutions to this equation, which we know would just be uh, 4 or 2. So if I get an x value of 4 or 2, that's going to be something I ha uh, that's going to be an extraneous solution to this equation, and I, I would eliminate that from my solution set. But it turns out that as long as the numerator is equal to 0, then the entire function is equal to 0, as long as Again, the 4 or 2 don't cause the numerator to be 0. And you can see from this simple equation that I'm really just trying to solve this equation. So x equals negative 7. When y equals 0, x is equal to negative 7. That's not an extraneous solution. If I put negative 7 into the bottom here, I would get, you know, I would not get 0. So I'd have 0 on top divided by some non-zero number. That would give me 0. x equal to negative 7. And I would write this in coordinate form as an x-intercept right there. Y-intercepts are, are, are even easier because in order to find the y-intercept, I'm really just plugging in 0 for x, h of 0. So let me just do that. 0 plus 7 divided by 0 squared minus 6 times 0 plus 8. So you can see this just equals 7 divided by 8. So my y-intercept is 0, 0,7 eighths.